All right, we're going to talk about basal ganglia disorders. And so usually a lot of basal ganglia disorders are classified in the range of movement disorders. And so um, you can look at them on a scale of between hypokinetic, meaning less movement, and hyperkinetic, meaning more movement. And we'll talk about some different disorders. So um, usually difference in abnormal movements are due to dysfunction in specific parts of basal ganglia, um, the PPN, and the midbrain locomotor region. So we talked a little bit in the first section about how complicated all the anatomy of the basal ganglia and all, the, all of its different functions. So you can imagine that um, basal ganglia dysfunction is going to affect a lot of different areas. So um, sometime, uh, some basal ganglia disorders inhibit uh, motor thalamus, PPN, and MLR. Excessive inhibition results in the hypokinetic disorders. So those are like uh, Parkinson's and the Parkinson's uh, related disorders. Um, inadequate inhibition um, results in hyperkinetic disorders. That makes sense, right? If you have excessive inhibition, you have less movement. If you have not enough inhibition, you have more movement. Okay, so well, hopefully that part makes sense. So the most common basal ganglia motor disorder is Parkinson's disease. Um, there are about a million people in the U.S. currently who have been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Um, Parkinson's interferes with both voluntary and automatic movements. And that makes sense from what we talked about in terms of basal ganglia function. Um, there are basically three subtypes, or two subtypes that are mixed, if you want to think of it that way. Um, akinetic or rigid Parkinson's. Um, tremor dominant Parkinson's or mixed, which has features from both. So 50% um, of uh, people that you run across with Parkinson's are the akinetic or rigid version. Um, tremor dominant 40% and mixed 10%. So, um, and those um, statistics are um, as of 2013. So um, I haven't read anything to the effect that that has changed a lot. But within all the subtypes, too, there, um, Parkinson's is staged, just like a lot of diseases are staged. So um, the, uh, peop the two um, movement specialists who originally staged Parkinson's are named Hone and Yar. And so they'll talk about Hone and Yar stages one through five. So stage one is, is early, par early onset Parkinson's. Um, usually they have um, some effects in one side of their body um, and they still are fully functional. Um, all their uh, walking and everything is um, not affected. Um, once you get into stage two and three, you get a little more effect um, towards the later part of stage three and into stage four. Both sides are affected, and a lot of times people will need an assistive device to help with their walking. When you get to Hone and Yar stage five, um, the person has uh, lost a lot of their mobility. And um, so, in, depending on where you work, if, if you work in outpatient treating Parkinson's people, you will usually see maybe stage one to three. Um, a lot of times you don't see the later stages unless you work in um, acute care or a, a long-term care facility. So um, all of those people though can be helped by physical therapy. So um, that is a really nice thing. So I've, I've worked with people who were very stiff and um, almost immobile. And then I've worked with people who are very high functioning. So um, people all along the spectrum of Parkinson's. So this is the pathology page from the book. Um, the, the pathology is those um, substantia nigra cells and some of the uh, dopaminergenic neurons in the PPN start to die off. Um, the etiology, they talk about oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, and programmed cell death. They, don't, they still don't know what causes it. Um, so it's considered idiopathic. Um, it's a chronic speed of onset, and it is very insidious. People, the symptoms come on so slowly over many years that a lot of times people don't notice they have it until um, 
something affects their function or they develop a tremor is a lot of times the first um, symptom that people will seek medical attention for. Um, depression is common in Parkinson's because you have a chronic degenerative neuro disease. Um, I can understand why depression is common, but I talk about this a lot with my um, Parkinson's patient. It, it can be really um, psychologically debilitating because you just feel like maybe you're never going to get ahead of it, and you probably aren't. Um, dementia and psychosis um, or hallucinations can occur late in the disease and a lot of times that is a reaction to the medications. Being on the medications for long term can um, cause those hallucinations and I've had some of my patients tell me some really interesting hallucinations um, that they have in response to the medications but um, that is usually not common until they've probably been on the medications for 15-20 years so a pretty long time. Um, a lot of times they get alteration in sleep-wake cycles that cause daytime sleepiness. Um, restless leg syndrome is a big thing in Parkinson's and um, that can affect your sleep. Um, communication and memory is normal. Um, in late stages um, you might see some dementia but uh, often that is a reaction to the medications as well. So um, even though sometimes people with Parkinson's are slow to respond just because of motor issues, they have normal cognition and um, normal memory. And so um, you have to make sure that you're not uh, treating someone with Parkinson's like they have dementia because they don't. They can understand everything you're telling them, even if they can't react as quickly to it. Um, so there are some visual percep perceptual blocks because of that ocular motor loop um, in the basal ganglia. Uh, movement slows down or stops in response to nearby visual stimuli. So a lot of people have difficulty going through a door, stepping through a door, or stepping through a turnstile, um, or in a closed setting where there are other objects or people around. Um, there is a, a sensory cognitive mismatch in Parkinson's um, where they're not sensing the size of their movements. And you can work on that a lot in therapy as well. And LSVT Big is largely concerned with um, retraining that sensory cognitive mismatch. So we work a lot on large amplitude movements. Autonomic dysfunction, um, orthostatic hypotension is huge. Constipation can be an issue. Um, thermal dysregulation and bladder and sexual dysfunction. So it affects all areas of your life, basically. The hallmark um, symptom for Parkinson's are motor symptoms hypokinesis and rigidity. That stooped posture and shuffling gait um, usually is in later stages of Parkinson's. Um, difficulty initiating movements, turning and stopping, uh, arresting tremor, um, and then those visual perceptual movement blocks like going through doors. Freezing during movements is really common in Parkinson's and decreased postural control. So um, all of those things we address in physical therapy. Um, the basal ganglia um, is the area that's affected. Um, all different nuclei in the basal ganglia. So the onset is typically between 50 and 65 years of age um, and men and women are affected equally. But if you have Parkinson's, your um, substantia nigra cells have been dying off since you were 20 probably but just enough of them have to die off for you to see an effect that you don't see the effects until you're um, 50 or 65. And there is no diagnostic test that you can conclusively tell somebody has Parkinson's. There is a version of Parkinson's that is called um, young onset Parkinson's, and that's what Michael J. Fox has, um, where you, the effects start much earlier than 50 to 65 years of age. And I've also worked with people who um, were not diagnosed until their 70s or 80s. So um, even though they probably had it for a long time, the effects didn't come, become large enough for them to notice until they were older. So that's why that late diagnosis. Um, the uh, incidence and uh, prevalence are um, listed in the, the box there. It's progressive. Um, I think the, um, the information, the mean age at death is 75 years old. Death is not from Parkinson's. It's usually from heart disease or infection, so some other secondary um, reason that somebody died. Um, 
that mean age of death is going up. People are um, are realizing now that they have to be, they have to move more, they have to be more functional, and so there's less problem with heart disease and um, the consequences of immobility that's what gets you in Parkinson's. It's not the Parkinson's itself that gets you, it's the effects of immobility from the Parkinson's that gets you. So um, the mean age of death is going up. Treatment uh, medication, there are dopamine replacement drugs and dopamine um, agonists, which help uh, stimulate dopamine. Um, those are usually, that's usually the first drug that's prescribed. And the most common one you see is um, the generic name is carbidopa levodopa, or L-dopa, you'll hear it called, um, and its uh, market name is Cinemet. And you will see people in the clinic on Cinemet all the time. The side effects, and these are usually long-term side effects, being on the medication for a long time, are hallucinations, delusions, psychosis, and dyskinesia, so disorganized movements. And the um, progression of the disease and involvement involving other cells and neurotransmitters limit the effectiveness of the medication. So with Parkinson's medications, people tend to have um, what we call on-off times. And that is really um, different for every person, but they have times when the effects of the drug are fading and they have more problem with motor tasks. And then times when they're at their peak and they have less problem with motor tasks. So there's also um, a couple of invasive procedures. There's a surgery that's called deep brain stimulation where a stimulator is implanted in the thalamus. Um, they usually do one side and then they'll do the other. Um, I've worked with a lot of people with deep brain stimulation and it does do a lot to um, improve motor, um, motor skills, but it, um, it doesn't last forever. People with DBS tend to have problems with speech and swallowing earlier than um, people who don't have DBS, but it is, it's just another treatment that's out there. There is a um, video in the module um, with someone getting deep brain stimulation that's pretty interesting. There's also some um, neural transplant transplantation and destructive surgery where they take out parts. And I haven't worked with a lot of people that have those, that have had those, the, the DBS is definitely the more common um, procedure. And when people have DBS, it's sort of like having a pacemaker for your brain, if you want to think of it that way. And they have an implant um, in the thalamus, and then they have wires that go down to, and they have a little unit in the chest. It can be adjusted. The amount of stimulation can be increased or decreased, and usually people go in every few months um, to get that adjusted, or if they're having issues. So. Um, deep brain stimulation is uh, one of the more common surgeries. It doesn't cure Parkinson's, but it helps improve your um, motor issues. So in rehabilitation, um, physical therapy and occupational therapy help to improve mobility and functional status. Um, intense resistance training produces greater muscle hypertrophy and functional gains than standard exercise. Um, some of the recent research shows that um, vigorous exercise helps the dopamine persist longer in the synaptic cleft so people have better use of the neural substrate they have left. Um, there are lots of um, Parkinson's exercise programs out there now. There's one that's called Pedaling for Parkinson's and um, the YMCA here in Bellingham and in um, Ferndale have pedaling for Parkinson's programs and they have people, it's a spinning class, and they have people at 80 to 90 revolutions per minute, so pretty high um, intensity, um, pretty, um, it's intense and that's what you need. You need intense training, whether you're doing resistance training or cardiovascular training, you need to work hard. And I always tell my Parkinson's patients, um, if it doesn't challenge you, it's not going to change you. So um, in, when we do LSVT big, which is a large amplitude movement training, we push our patients hard, and that is our job. So um, you don't want to cheat your patients by giving them wimpy exercises. There are a group of syndromes that are called Parkinson's plus syndromes. Um, the reason that they are called Parkinson's plus, even though they have completely different um, etiology, is because they, um, they're often um, mistaken for Parkinson's and they have similar motor effects. 
So um, it's really important that um, some disorders with similar signs ha be distinguished from true idiopathic PD because the treatment is different and the prognosis is different as well. So um, there are certain red flags that indicate someone might not have um, true idiopathic PD. Uh, one of them is they have early postural instability. Um, so they have a lot more falls than someone with idiopathic Parkinson's. Idiopathic Parkinson's tends to be very gradual onset, um, insidious. You don't see a lot of change. Um, the, with the um, Parkinson's Plus syndromes, you see people have a lot of major falls early on. Rapid progression, things like pro um, progressive supranuclear palsy, um, has five years is the prognosis for that. Um, and so it, definitely a lot uh, r more rapid progression than idiopathic Parkinson's. Respiratory dysfunction is common in some of them. Abnormal postures. Um, uncontrollable and inappropriate laughter or crying. So that is affecting other areas of the brain um, besides the basal ganglia. And then signs of cerebellar, corticospinal, and voluntary gaze dysfunction. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that with the um, when I... Uh, with a couple of the specific ones, but there's some issues with maintaining gaze. So um, Parkinson's Plus is just the collective name for primary neurodegenerative diseases that cause signs similar to Parkinson's, even though they have a different etiology. Um, a lot of times, they either they're idiopathic or they're genetic. Um, so the syndromes that are included in this group are progressive supranuclear palsy, um, or they call it PSP, um, dementia with Lewy bodies, and multiple system atrophy. So both PSP and MSA um, are caused by the um, deterioration of tau proteins in your brain, which are structural proteins in the brain. So they're similar to Alzheimer's in that way, where the brain actually starts to break down. Um, both of them have um, very uh, quick progression and people lose function fast. And I have worked with people with PSP and Lewy body dementia and multiple system atrophy. And um, they can, they, they do respond to physical therapy, but it, their situation is so quickly progressive that they lose function quickly. And a lot of times we need to work with them and their families on um, planning for when they are gonna lose more motor function because it's probably gonna be sooner so um, PSP is characterized by the early onset of gait instability with a tendency to fall backwards. Um, I've had people that I've worked with with PSP fall so quickly and so hard that you had to catch them with both arms. So um, it, it's, a very, um, it's a very debilitating um, process because you have those big falls. Axial rigidity where they're really... Um, tight through their trunk, freezing of gait, depression, psychosis, rage attacks, and um, that supranuclear gaze palsy. Sometimes they'll call it doll's eyes, where somebody lies down and their eyes closed. They have difficulty maintaining an upward gaze. They have a, a difficulty locking their gaze on something. Um, that particular symptom is really difficult for friends and family members to deal with because someone can't meet your eyes. It's very uncomfortable. Um, and it's not on purpose, they just can't do it. Um, because of what's going on in their brain, um, it, it affects their ocular motor loop. So, Lewy body dementia is the only one of these syndromes that is limited only to men. Um, it does not happen in women. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so obviously there is, there's gotta be a genetic component to that. But Lewy body dementia causes early generalized cognitive decline, similar to Alzheimer's, visual hallucinations, and Parkinsonism, which is the um, motor um, dysfunction that's usually associated with Parkinson's. So it's kind of the worst of both worlds. Um, it's the dementia of Alzheimer's and the motor problems of Parkinson's. So really not a, not a good situation. I, I worked with one man with Lewy body dementia 
that we did large amplitude movements with. And the, the difficult part is he couldn't, he wasn't able to remember exercises from time to time. He did have a very supportive family and they helped him with it. And by um, doing the exercises with his family at home, he was able to improve his gait and um, improve its safety. So even though we're not going to see big um, gains, we're going to see at least improve his safety. That I mean, that's a big thing right there. Multi-system atrophy is um, progressive, degenerative, affects basal ganglia, cerebellar autonomic systems, and the peripheral nervous system, and the cerebral cortex, because it's the, those structural proteins in the brain um, breaking down. And it is kind of sad working with someone with MSA or PSP because they decline so quickly, and a lot of it is um, education, um, safety, and... Um, is sort of getting their family ready for for what's coming. So um, it's not a good uh, it's not a good prognosis, that's for sure. So with um, Parkinsonism as a general term, it encompasses all disorders with signs that um, mimic Parkinson's, but the cause is not um, the structural causes like the Parkinson's plus syndromes, um, but it's known to be toxic, infectious, or traumatic. So it's often a side effect of drugs that treat psychosis or digestive problems. Um, it can lead to a, a lot of times misdiagnosis and unnecessary treatment for Parkinson's disease in older adults. So when people have Parkinson's plus syndromes or Parkinsonism um, due to uh, toxicity um, or trauma, a lot of times they're put on those um, Parkinson's medications that don't help them in any way. And so, unfortunately, um, that differential diagnosis is really important in the um, Parkinson's-related um, disorders that aren't idiopathic Parkinson's. So, um, signs of Parkinsonism include acute bilateral onset. So, with idiopathic Parkinson's, it's unilateral onset. Um, rapid progression, early postural tremor, and involuntary movements of the face and mouth. So, um, those... Uh, they're also the traumatic Parkinsonism is um, like you see in uh, someone like a boxer that has had has been injured head injuries too many times. I included in the module a video of uh, Muhammad Ali when he lit the torch at the Atlanta Olympics in 1996, and you can really see that tremor. So um, I'm going to wrap this up, and then I'm going to do another um, little short section talking about hyperkinetic disorders. Okay, I hope I didn't...